Okay, all you rocket people. I know you're here to listen to Ken Scott remix some of his famous tracks, and that's cool. But when you had enough of that, you might want to come by the McDSP booth because they're giving away some free stuff, like plugins, swag, all kinds of goodies. Free stuff. And because you're stuck here with us at the NAMM show, because you can't get out of the building because the security lines at this point on Saturday, <laughs> they're at least two miles long. You're not even going to find your car. So just give up and stick around with us for a while. My friend Richard Furch, who's produced people like Prince, Outkast, Frank Ocean, Tyrese. Yeah, he's kind of a heavy hitter. He doesn't just have a studio. He has like a studio in his backyard with like tennis courts and a volcano pool and all kinds of, it's like a hike just to get back there. Anyway, so if you want to know how to make enough music to have a studio you have to hike to in your own backyard, you should talk to Richard, right? He might also plug a McDSP plugin or two on the way, maybe. So Richard, how you been? <laughs> Good, that was probably the best, best introduction I ever had. Uh, the, the basketball court is correct. The volcano is pretty much correct at this point because uh, we, we ripped down the big house and now we're building an even bigger house, so everything is looking actually like there is a, like a sand, sand mountains everywhere with boulders on top of them. But that's when you build your studio soundproof from inside and outside, so I can't hear them. But it look, kind of looks cool. Like you look out the window, my studio has windows, and you see bulldozers going up and down over sand while you're mixing a record. It's kind of cool. Okay. Always up for a challenge, I see. Speaking of challenges, I know you probably would say, well, of course Richard's successful because he has this fancy studio. He must be able to get great sounds for all his clients all the time. But there was this one time that your studio was kind of altered by a large tree falling on it. How did you get through that difficult time? Because you were working at, at that moment. That's right, that's right. That's, uh, it's funny, now that I just told you that I have a construction site in my, uh, in my studio, you bringing up that uh, six years ago or so, a tree fell into my studio and destroyed it all. Uh, that was fun. It was actually after Tyree's session with um, uh, with Will I Am, and those go those tend to go late. <laughs> so it's like five in the morning. Everybody leaves. They brought 14 people and their entourage and their six cars, and they were obnoxiously loud in a good way. So I fell asleep in the control room and was woken up at like 11 the next day by like this thump and then it was kind of like an earthquake we have those in California obviously a lot but nothing was shaking anymore so I went outside and yeah an 85 foot tree was inside of my studio and now it started to rain and so within the same day my whole studio got destroyed by water damage I was super super lucky firemen came in and uh, helped me tear down the gear like basically what, what takes you about a year to put in with cables only takes about 20 minutes to get out into the dry part of the studio. And uh, well, then you go to a f good friend of mine that you might know, um, Michael Bodica, do you know him? Yeah, a uh, great synthesis. He's probably here somewhere today. And I was able to shack up with him for seven months. I, he had the room, I had the gear, and you just keep going. You, I mean, these records need to be made. You cannot just call your client and say, I'm sorry, I'm out of business now. You just make it work. And uh, actually, that, uh, so that, that Tyrese record was being made that whole time in that new studio, actually. Um, it was called Open Invitation. This came out 2011, 2012, something like that. Uh, and it was a good hit for him. And um, yeah, so y you keep going in the face of uh, destruction. Noted. Well, even in the face of destruction, do you find occasionally a plug-in from a certain vendor might, you know, help you do your job just a little better? Maybe? I hope? Well, what, what certainly happens is in the face of destruction, the first thing you see when, the, when you come to is green. And so you realize, of course, MacDSP has been, has been around for, well, as we know now, 20 years. I've been not around for all of those 20 years, but maybe, maybe, maybe I say 15 and you say 17 and we might be right somewhere. Anyway, but, but it was always there. It was, uh, I mean, the most important thing actually when Pro Tools came up or when it actually became the thing to have in a studio. Because when I started about 2000, everything was still analog or DA88s. 
the occasional ADAT or uh, Sony 3348 machine, of course. Um, but then within about a year or so, that changed from, from these tape formats to mostly Pro Tools formats. And the two things you always had to have were the green plugins and waves. <laughs> Those were like, if, if, if you were any studio at all, you had these two. And if, if any engineer wanted to complain, hey, but you don't have X, XYZ plugin, then you go like, I don't care. Unless it's Mac DSP, I don't have to have it. So filter bank, compressor bank were probably the very first two that were just a staple on everything. And I think like uh, Dave Pensado just said it too, like it was one of those first moments where you go, okay, we're going from this, what was called the EQ7 or EQ3 uh, Avid thing, we need, we need to get something that reminds me more of mixing on the console, reminds me of more of the hardware that we had that we love to tweak. And that's where you came in with all your curves and uh, do, do I remember this right? Like when you actually read the manual for the filter bank, you can't use any of the names, so you have all these cool names. The, was the British, the, the, and you're like, ah, oh, can you just tell me which one it is? Is it the 2055 or is it 2044? Uh, well, actually, one of those is an EQ and one is a compressor. But you know what I mean, right? Like, like especially the layman or the person who's just started, like more wanted to know exactly, so which one are we actually modeling? Is it the 1061 or the 1073 or is it the 1081 or is it the 33609? The, the compressor, the British compressor, that must be the 33609. But wait, SSL is also British. Crap. <laughs> Lots of confusion, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. But it started like, it, uh, seriously, like to, from there to yesterday's mix, literally. The filter bank is used in every day. Uh, every day. I use mostly on vocals at this point. Uh, and then you added all these extra goodies. Uh, a lot of people like the FUDS box. I happen to like a lot of the utility plugins, like the AE600 now. Uh, what was the one for, before that? A400, right? 400. I, I really like the 600, apart from just more bands, but also just a couple more functions. They love the previews, like uh, um, so the audio previews, the, the solo of the band. I love the way that you can really, really dial it in. I, I do, I do quite this quite amount of um, uh, dynamic EQing for for two reasons. I mean, one, one the the thing that a lot of people do, like I need a little less harsh here, but everything else has a lot of good presence. Or I need a little bit less, less muddy here, but everything has a lot of good uh, warmth around it. I do that. But I also, these days I find very often you get vocal tracks that might have um, weird whistle frequencies in them. Like it's almost like little feedbacks. And I think, I'm actually, uh, I'm talking to that about with other engineers. I think it has something to do with people recording in smaller and smaller booths, like closets, yeah. etc. Yeah. They put the R legs on there. I mean, like a booth, a vocal booth should really be like at minimum like seven by seven feet, something like that, you know. But now we're recording in things where a person can just barely stand in. And so I get these tracks and I see these artifacts. And I, I, I'm not quite sure what it is. It could be a, a momentary feedback through the headphones. It could be a, just a build up. Um, we're, we're really, uh, like, I'm really talking to people like, that. did you see that? What do you think? What are you doing? Etc. cetera. And uh, I, I actually use the AA600 with like super high Q, like not so much notch, but you have these different Q settings. I use the very high Q settings with uh, frequencies that are very close to, to each other. They might be, let me just make something up. They might be 3900, 4100, and 4500, because that's where you can really like needle laser into these into these sounds and when they happen they get down what's well, sorry they get knocked down and whatever whatever is less i could obviously automate either with within the same eq or with another eq on top of that but it really has helped it has helped me make great sounding tracks out of things that were certainly compromised cool there you go yeah. good timing was. He's on the farewell tour because he said he wants to be with his kids, so he says, I'm going to go on a farewell tour for three years. That's what I'm going to do. He's got a lot of fans. I'm going to do a farewell career for 25 more years because I want to have more time with my kids. 
Um, can you, um, I've talked to you about this before, but um, just how you went from where you started or how you decided to, because you, you're like, like your, your face of destruction kind of scenario, but like, some of the jumps you've made in your career, you've, you've like, you know, like when you, when you went like from New York to LA, you know, that was like a big jump and you were really established in New York already and you seem to be a guy that's willing to take these like big steps once you recognize that's where things are going. You're like, I'm in and you go. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I, start, I went to first the SAE and then to Berkeley. I graduated from both, which is not something you should do. You should not go twice to an audio school. Just go once when you, if you want to. But then I went to uh, New York afterwards and started at Sound on Sound, a, a place that David Amlin is currently rebuilding, actually, in New Jersey. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, he's building a new... Actually, he's just finished building three rooms, I think. Full scale, Euphonics and Neve rooms. Um, and so I dealt with a lot of hip hop. I mean, this is New York. This is where I, where I came. I came from a background of listening to um, Cypress Hill and Gangstar and uh, uh, what, Arrested Development, stuff like that. So things that uh, that would would lend themselves to be in the New York scene, you know. And uh, I saw I started at a studio that basically during the day made jingles and jazz records, and at night said, "Well, we have 12 more hours to sell here at studio time." and um, sold them to hip hop, uh, basically hip hop royalty, because it was right next to Daddy's house, which is um, P. Diddy's, or, uh, now Diddy's, I don't know what he was called at the time, <laughs> studio. Um, so it worked a lot with, uh, um, with Lil' Kim, or, and then also R&B acts like uh, 112, or Carl Thomas was big at the time. Um, so, but at one point you go like, okay, fine. I've I've, I've killed most of my nights. I I actually had have had a wife already, and she's still with me. So so it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it was time to maybe find some different music. You know, like some just new new challenges. Also, what, what you what you realize is that when you do a lot of hip hop, is there's obviously not much recording going on. I mean, the the actual music is all programmed. Uh, you have a lot of you might have a lot of vocals, of course, yeah, but uh, but there's not much acoustic guitars or not that I like acoustic guitars. I just said that now, so I want more of that, and I decided that I wanted to go to the West Coast, and a very smart man, Brian Maloof. Do you know him? Yeah, yeah he's a he's a great uh, mixer. At the time, he was an A and R too. Um, he told he said something very smart. He says if you go to another place. Um, don't just go there because, because then you're just gonna start all over again at the bottom. Nobody's gonna know you. You're gonna basically repeat all of your uh, plights, you know. So he says, well, just make sure there's a reason to go. And finally, there was a there was a gig in New York that uh, a visiting producer from the West Coast uh, wanted to work with me, and I, so I, I went I went to LA, worked with him for a couple of weeks, and then I called my wife and was like. I guess we're moving, like like now. And I was out of New York within a week, you know. So and then I looked for new music, new, more engineering opportunities. Over time, I basically stayed in the same kind of music. Like I, I, I do a lot of R&B. I do a lot of pop R&B because these days, there's a lot of overlap there, you know. Uh, of course, I still do rap, um, but um, uh, when you're mixing, at least I can mostly mostly uh, call my hours. So they can, they can do their recording all they want until the wee hours in the morning. That's cool, just as long as you send me the file, we'll be fine. Wow, and um, I want to ask you, um, I don't know, does anyone have some questions for Richard? He's kind of an expert. He's pretty good at what he does. I, I, I am an expert. Okay, he, he is an, <laughs> see, he is an expert. When you were learning, how did you, what was the process that you went to through to learn like what a record was? Like Cypress Hill, that's some out there stuff. It wasn't like you could listen to a Beatles record and know your Cypress Hill record was done and that's a professional mix. And then also what's your like, how do you print? You know, that's like, how do you print inside of Pro Tools? Do you go out of the box and then back in? Or those are two questions. Okay, I mean, the first part is the first part is this, a really smart question, you know. Like, of course, I can buy myself a Rickenbacker and try to be a Beatles something, something, and then walk into um, walk into a hip hop session and just look like a fool, 
well, or, or maybe they're like the coolest guy ever because maybe they have a need for that, I don't know. But like, uh, obviously the most important thing is that you are genre specific, right? Like, my, my I had a, uh, it's funny that you bring up these two because of course I have a background in Beatles as well. I'm a pianist myself because when you go to Berkeley, you have to be a full-fledged musician. I was at, uh, at the time I was trying to be a, a, a jazz musician as well, but I knew that I, that was not a long-term um, career. But, uh, but I, have, I can hold my own, I can still play. Um, but, but just knowing where, where these come from and knowing, learning that, for instance, like a Cypress Hill record might have been made with an MPC-60, I'm not sure if that's true, but it would be a good guess, right? Actually, the funny part, the very first session I assisted in New York was for DJ Muggs, who, who obviously made some of these records. And then DJ Premier later for who does Gangstar, etc. So you, it, it's funny, like, obviously I have a very specific way of thinking of how a record is made. I, I started in Cakewalk at the time, which I think just shut out its, shut out its doors like two months ago or something like that. Like two, yeah, about two months ago. Oh. Weird. Yeah. I liked it. I, I, I literally worked with it when it still had these little black dots as a sequence. It was, it was cool. It was awesome. Um, but all of a sudden, you get introduced into this whole different world of, OK, so we're using the MPC. Th like for instance, working with the Neptunes at the time, which is Pharrell's f production outfit. Um, they were using an ASR-10 and an MPC-3000 and actually the Cork 01W workstation. But that was all. Like, that's where their sound came from, you know? So you learn that basically everybody grabs what instruments they have, what technology they have, and they they made them theirs, and they made a sound out of it. And so, so full circle back, like, I, I don't know if this is the exact historical thing, but like, if, if George Harrison picked up a Rickenbacker, there's a George Harrison sound. Had he picked up an MPC 3000, which was not there, then that would have been part of his sound, probably. Uh, so the gear, his gear, for instance, is, is part of my sound, too. Like the, and this is why, like, oh, okay, we're here 17 years later, thousands of EQ plugins came out, and, and also models of the same kind of thing. Like, I, I probably bought eight SSL emulations over the term, because everybody comes out and says, now it's right, now it's right, now it's right. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's very expensive, this kind of ev ev uh, behavior, but it's true. Um, and yet, yesterday I get up from the board and on my lead vocal is still filter bank because there's this thing, this this thing about the high end, and I don't I don't know, maybe you can tell me what it is, but there is a there's both a presence to it which you can okay, let's say I put let's say I put a 10k I actually for some reason I I like bells at the top because I just don't get the very, very top messed with unless I want it. So let's say I take a 10k bell move it up by, let's say, 3, 4 dB, but have a cue, not at one, which is, I think, the st stock, like the, the first thing that comes up, but I, mean, I might turn it up to, like, two or three even. So what I get is, like, you get this, this brightness that's forward, but you can decide how far into your low mid-range you get. I mean, this is not very smart. This is not news to you. I get that. But the way the, the filter bank does this, it's very controllable, and it does exactly this particular vocal sheen that works really, really well. And this is some of the things that why we judge equalizers. We equalize, sorry, we judge them for the smoothness or for their openness or for their mid-range and every single one has one of these. And this is what Filterbank does for me. And even having all the other ones, it has never been replaced. So that's very important to me. And that goes back to that MPC 3000 slash Rickenbacker slash Filter bank E, uh, sorry, a P6, right? Yeah, P6. So the other question was, uh, oh, the printing. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I tell you how that record is done. This Wednesday, I get a phone call. Can you mix this record to, that has to be mastered on Friday? I'm like, yeah, sure, I can do it. So they send the files. I mix it on Wednesday, leave it up overnight, and uh, send them a version on midday Thursday. Now, here's your records. So let me know, we're on a timeline, right? I hear nothing back for like six hours. And I'm like, guys, I mean, it's not my timeline, it's yours. So I'm here, but not for the whole night. <laughs> Just tell me what you need. So then I get a, get, a, um, get a revision, nothing hard, right? Little vocal app, whatever, or something like that, and a couple other things. I send it back, and then I hear nothing. And like, literally at 10 PM, I'm like, 
I'm going home. I'm not waiting for this. So then they approve the mix like sometime in the morning, and it actually gets mastered at noon on Friday by my good guys at uh, Lurston Mastering. They're, they're, they're really great. Um, and then like at 2 p.m. they call, so there's one more mix change. So I'm like, uh, which of course, of course I did for them, but I'm like, that, that answers your questions. It's done when either every, all six, seven parties have listened to it or when we're out of time. You know, I, I try to send out a first version where I go like, if nobody says anything, I believe this is done. This could go on the radio tomorrow. This feels good to me. Now, I could be wrong because a lot of these things are opinions, right? But I will never send something out where I go like, well, obviously we need to have two or three more rounds. So yeah, the first print could be the one or the 10th print could be the one because you just don't know how many people are involved involved but musically speaking it's done when it feels good it's i do something i, I do something on um on instagram every wednesday it's hashtags mix tips wednesday I, I write things about exactly these kind of questions and one of those things is i turn around um with my uh, with my with my back to the speakers i might do now some email or whatever and i just circle the song in the back and it might do that for 20, 30 times, and it's uh, not super low, but l lower, right? And then if the last like five times it comes around, I just don't feel like changing anything, that's when I think the first version is done. Then we're like, okay, that's, this is what I got. Now, if somebody gives me a cool input saying, well, you know, the, the strings could be more featured here and this and that, the other, that might lead on my side to another idea. So, and then, so it's a little bit of an evolving beast, but it's the, most of the time it's done when time's up, you know. But. Oh. I do, uh, it's funny, like for the last 10 years or so, I had a hybrid system. I still have about 30 or 40 um, hardware compressors. I actually have, I have no hardware EQs for some reason. I, I just need, I, uh, well, that's not true. I actually have a 2055, but I don't use a hardware EQ because I think I need that instead of a plug-in, for instance, right? So, but for some reason, I have some, some hardware compressors still and actually a lot of digital reverbs from the 80s still, a lot of lexicon stuff. Um, so it is officially still a hybrid system, but about five years ago when I still had um, analog summing, I got rid of the summing. I, I don't know what it was. It might have been Pro Tools 10. When uh, at one point they went into the uh, floating point math, and all of a sudden you had more headroom, and it was just easier to. Uh, let, let me say it like this: instead of it was easier to, I'm going to say it was harder to mess it up. You know, yeah, you you could do really silly stuff and still fix yourself at the master fader kind of thing. Uh, and for some reason, the actual summing seemed better to me. So I had, around that time I got rid of the analog summing. So now I have like half hybrid where like some things I can still send out of an insert, but actually the final summing is all still, is all digital at this point. And, um, and also the master bus is all digital. And I, I kind of feel, I, uh, it's a little bit of something that you think of, it's, it's like a belief system. All of a sudden you go like, well, if I'm not analog summing and I'm okay with like, Digital, digital information flo flying left and right in my computer, say, why, why should I not be okay to also have a digital master bus, right? So like, you argue with yourself, you do some kind of listening for a while, but at the end, I, it's kind of embarrassing. I do have a very, very digital mix bus, and on that mix bus, I actually, like for instance, an Avid uh, Impact plugin, which is one of the oldest SSL try the style clones. It's, it probably doesn't even claim it's modeled after. It's just the, the idea of it. But I think that just sounds great. So something, something just like you could say Les Paul invents a guitar in 1950. I don't know exactly when. And um, you could arguably say, well, you had 60 days, uh, 60 years to 70 years almost um, to make a better guitar, but you still use that one, right? The same, like there are specific plugins. Oh, this is going to be a super, super sweet segue. There's some specific plugins that just get it right and they stick around, such as these. <laughs> See how I did that. <laughs> Nicely done. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll be here all week. <laughs> Not really. 
No, but uh, that's really true. I mean, so the filter bank, I, I, you would know if it has changed. I think the code better probably has changed from the uh, from fixed to from TDM to RTES to uh, flow fi uh, sorry f floating point AAX, uh, and then the whole thing. Let's not talk about that AAX was supposed to be the same code, but then really was just TDM and RTES in a different name, right? So, but but the actual function and sound I think has not changed, or has it? it has not. That was actually when Avid said, "Oh, we're going from TDM fixed point." So like you know this new HX system floating point and yeah it's better fidelity all those reasons it, and it actually I think the HDX card is actually the best embedded audio DSP system that you can buy on just because it, it just has the most programmability the most capacity for doing things but yeah that was a huge like wait what it's like someone said hey we loved your stereo mix we now want it in 4.3 this new surround format with like subs and a speaker over the top of your head and one in your butt it's like why so you know it, it's very stressful to have to convert it. So um, when that was done, about two and a half years of just taking the code to make it work on the new way of doing things, and also the rest of the formats we're going to support. Yeah, it did not, it was a new code base, but it was like painstakingly made to be, you know, to match. And it was, yeah, I'm glad to have customers like you that actually care about that stuff to say, oh, I just wasted two and a half years of doing nothing except you're know, going, ah. And then you're like, yeah, I still use it. Oh. Woo, okay, we're okay. Well, well I, I try to use normal headrooms with your plugins, which I know I don't have to anymore, yeah. except for I'm gonna run out of uh, like threshold range, right? Yeah, yeah. so I, I personally, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge, uh, uh, I think gain staging these days, it's not as big of a deal sound-wise, because we, you actually can fix later, like, so when I say later, down, uh, down the signal flow, but musically speaking, uh, a lot of uh, plugins, but also obviously hardware, lives in a specific range where it works the best. Or and also let's let's say let's say you have uh, ten different keyboards and they're all at different levels, which is something I don't want to see, right? So my my expected behavior of my plugin will be different for all of these sources. But if I actually use okay uh, gain staging which I do with a lot of trim plugins, I don't really use clip gain, then, um, uh, then the expected outcome will be reached faster, I think. And also, like, my threshold will be always in the, well, I'm going to make this up now, in the minus 15 dB range and never once at, like, plus 4 and then minus 6 and minus well. That That is kind of weird to me. So, like, a usability of the plugin. And then when you actually have an analog model plugin, if they did it right, it should also have a sweet spot, and that sweet spot should be somewhere in the gain staging range and not all the way up, unless you happen to have, unless you want to have everything distorted, <laughs> I suppose. Say it again? Oh, so um, I print to a print track. I, uh, two tr print tracks, actually, because I always. I print a limited and a non-limited version at the same time for the mastering engineer. So I had two print tracks at all times. Uh, that is just a, it kind of looks a little bit like one of those film, uh, film score uh, templates where you automatically have a bunch of stems happening. That's kind of how it's set up. But it doesn't go back out and I don't bounce. I don't bounce, um, some people for a while had a reason like, oh, I don't bounce because bouncing sounds bad, which I actually never believed, uh, whatever. Whatever, I, I just never believed it. I thought the, the biggest problem with bouncing offline is that I have no, uh, no quality control. Like, I have to just believe that it happened. Like, I have to believe that the file that came out is perfect, right? Which is kind of weird to me. I mean, shouldn't I, like, at least when I print, shouldn't I sit in front of it and go like, yep, that was good. And that, so it's, it's weird. I, I just try to stay away from bouncing. But, uh, but, that's the reason why. Um, well, sh should we give away some plugins or any we more questions? Give, for actually, Richard? actually, no. Let, let's wrap it up. Let's. Them, they need to buy it. They oh. need to buy your plugins. Well, you need to buy our stuff. That way, we can keep coming back to the NAM show and having fine folks like Richard come back to the booth and tell you all the secrets. In fact, we should give it up for Richard right now. Yay! Okay, let's give away some plugins. Okay, now let's give away some plugins. Okay, does everyone have a red raffle ticket? And also, make sure that Nicole or someone has scanned your badge. We'll enter you in a raffle after the show.